the museum of the future is still a bit of a mystery. Well, it's not this massive skyscraper. Um, probably one of the largest rabbit models I think yes. ever constructed. How involved is His Highness and his direct team with, with the approvals of the project? Focal point for the nation. This would leave legacy for future projects in Dubai as well to follow. So yeah, will we actually be the first lead platinum museum building in the entire Middle East? Um, you run one of the most iconic projects in Dubai, but for many, um, the Museum of the Future is still a bit of a mystery. Can you maybe explain what the museum is? Sure, yeah, yes, it's a clearly one of the most noticeable construction projects in a city filled with construction projects, but um, everyone notices the building. Um, so really, what most people don't realize is it is truly a museum about how we will live in the future. So the Museum of the Future is about projecting ourselves 30, 40, 50 years into the future and looking at how we will live in a world that's been fairly radically changed by climate, by technology, uh, by population, immigration, all of these things. And we really want to examine how do people live at different scales. So from a more global scale to a new kind of ecosystem scale to then personally how will we live and how will our health and wellness be impacted by those changes. That's really interesting. I think I'll be one of your first uh, visitors in, in 2020 when, when you guys are, um, are open. Um, what can we expect? I mean, uh, is, it, is it a place that I'd like to visit with my family, with my kids? Uh, who's your target audience and what can they see there? Absolutely. So we are targeting the broadest possible audience. So this is a fantastic place for people that are maybe coming here on business to come and, and visit and see, but also families to come. Tourists are coming from all over the world. We're expecting to invite everyone in. We'll have an entire floor of the building dedicated to young children's experiences nice. um, on the same topic areas, but just tailored to a younger audience. And we really hope that people locally here in the Dubai area can come on a regular basis and use that space, um, as well as the tourists and others that come in. But it, the intent is to be for everyone. That's amazing. Uh, one of the most distinctive features of the building is, is obviously its architectural design. I, I mean, you, you know, anyone passing al along it um, on, on Sheikh Zayed Road is bound to be drawn to that organic shape uh, or structure taking shape. Um, what, what do you brief your designer in this case? What do you tell them to get such an iconic design? Sure, I mean, it really is a striking building in part because of the scale. It's not this massive skyscraper, right? And so it's sure. surrounded by much larger buildings, but yet it has, a, this, I would say, more of a center of gravity than any of the buildings in the area, which is really incredible. And I think that that's a testament to a very unique design brief, which was not to build something of, with, with any preconceptions about you know, what it needed to be as far as the siting, the, the dimensions of it, the height. It was wide open, the competition. So it was really asking architects from all over the world to bring their most creative, innovative, kind of craziest ideas to the project. Um, and Sean Killa from Killa Design, um, who's a local architect, um, yes. interestingly. And it was really looking towards the future, but also it was looking at the history and the culture of the area. So, you know, with the Arabic calligraphy inscribed all over the facade of the building, clearly has a connection back to its, its roots being here in the Gulf region. Um, and the interiors of the space as well have many nods to that history and culture. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the facade, and, and it's certainly uh, one of the incredible features of the building as well. Um, especially with the Arabic calligraphy by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed. Um, can you maybe speak about the technologies that were used to get to that facade? Because uh, <laughs> you know, I know construction did, ha did not have, was not mature enough um, you know, to, to get to that vision. Sure, so I mean, the, the building is so unique, so complex, um, that it was, I would say, maybe a little ahead of its time. Yes. I think the technology, you know, as the building has progressed, the technology is kind of caught up to the building. Um, so that's where we're at now, and that it's, we're, we're better integrated with the technology, uh, which is somewhat fitting for a museum of the future. It was just maybe a little bit too far into the future. Uh, every time I see one of those panels, it's hard, I think, for people who haven't been up close to one to see the complexity of an individual panel. Uh, so each panel you know, is driven um, by the 3D modeling of the building itself. So the entire building has been modeled in 3D. Um, the whole thing is in Revit. Um, probably one of the largest Revit models I think yes. ever constructed. Uh, that's what, what I understand. Uh, and so e the fabrication of each panel is driven by the model directly because each panel is this incredibly complex curve. Um, so it's you know, curved in pretty much every dimension. It's mm -hmm. like if you took an egg and you kind of cracked it into a bunch of pieces. Um, but then each panel you know, has an internal ribbing structure. It has um, the kind of 
the main structure of the panel, which is a composite, and then a dimpled and um, laser-cut stainless steel skin, which you don't see until you get up close, you know, the, the dimension in the skin itself. Um, and then the glazing that's also embedded in it, and the LED lighting that's embedded around the glazing. So just when you look at how many layers and the complexity of each panel, it's a little mind-blowing, honestly, to, to see. And then now they're being installed and fitted up to each other. Um, and, and in a seamless way, almost. It, it certainly is amazing, and, and you know, just to think that there are nearly 900 of those panels. It's, it's over, a thousand, actually. over a thousand. <laughs> over a thousand. Well, that's momentous panels. work. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, like the standout structure, we have got a podium of three levels, and then a building of seven levels. Can you maybe uh, share a bit of the functions of each, or each of the levels? The building itself, which represents humans' ingenuity and creativity, um, and that's where all the exhibitions uh, will be housed. And the void represents the future. Uh, so that yeah. was Sean's concept for the, the different pieces of the building. Um, and in these levels, we'll have um, on, really the visitor experience starts on the fifth floor, which is um, right about here. So the fifth floor is where people will come up in an incredible sort of media rich experience, I, um, I will say. I'm not gonna say a whole lot more to completely give it away, uh, but we'll transport people to that fifth floor. Um, and then the exhibitions really fit in this whole part of the building here. Um, so they'll travel through these really immersive future exhibitions um, down fifth floor, fourth floor, third floor, um, and then onto the second floor, which has this kind of incredible um, space where you've got the calligraphy coming over your head. And so the, what become, was the walls now becomes the ceiling and the light spilling in. On that floor, we'll have more current and near future technologies on display. So yes. people will be able to see kind of what's coming really soon, what they might be able to access very soon in technology, rather than in these floors where we're looking really 30 and 40 years out in the future. Um, and then the level below it, down on one, is where we have our um, children's exhibition, so an entire floor dedicated to that. Um, and then back down into that mound, we have a retail space, we have a cafe, uh, we have a fairly large auditorium where we can do a lot of fantastic programming there as well. So, Leith, being, uh, being a very monumental project with high-profile dignitaries as stakeholders, how do, you, how do you manage communication and approvals with them? One of the things that's been really useful for us is because we're designing everything in 3D, the ability to do visualizations and 3D fly-throughs that show everyone up to His Highness exactly what the project is going to look like. So it's not a matter of you know, still image and saying, well, like, imagine it's kind of like this. It's more of a matter of actually taking them through the spaces and seeing what the content will be in a very dynamic way. And being able to do that fairly seamlessly because we're always evolving those models. They're always available to work off of. And we're, we're continuing that practice now through the exhibition design. So as we're designing these immersive experiences in the exhibitions, we also can, can visualize those in 3D. And how, how involved is His Highness and his direct team with, with the approvals of the project? So the impetus um, for the project really came from His, his Highness. After the World Government Summit, um, immersive experiences that DFF created, he had the vision of, well, let's do a real museum that's a permanent part of Dubai and actually a focal point for the nation. Um, so that's really you know, what's been driving the project is that vision that he had, and we've been carrying that out. Um, and what's been amazing, I think, for pe people that are not in the government is that it's been so incredibly seamless and it's been such a great collaboration and so kind of easy in a sense. And the government's been pushing very hard to make things more agile, more flexible, um, much more collaborative in doing projects like this. And we've really benefited from that. It's um, probably been one of the you know, most streamlined approval processes um, and projects in general that I've been involved with in my career. I'm sure that this complexity generated unique challenges. Um, can you maybe speak about some unique technologies that were used there uh, to overcome those challenges? Sure. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, this is a project where we committed to BIM from the beginning um, and going all the way up to level 500 um, throughout the entire process. I and mean, this is not something I think that's normally done, um, yeah. particularly on a building this complex. But it was, it's proven to be essential. I just walked through the site the other day, and when you look at particularly the MEP integration, because it's nothing is flat, nothing is straight, right? There's no square corner hardly in the building. And so when you think about how you have to integrate all the mechanical systems and things into that space, 
I don't know how you would do it without doing it all in 3D. Mm. It's really essential. And then even on site, you know, contractors using that 3D model, you know, walking around with their you know smartphones and, and pulling this up and looking at okay, how do these things integrate? Uh, right now, the there's curved panels also inscribed with calligraphy in the atrium space. Um, massive kind of domed atrium. Every one of those panels also three-dimensionally curved has to be perfectly fitted up and positioned in the space. And so being able to use that 3D model and using you know, the layout to figure out how each one of those perfectly fits in there, I don't see how you would do it any other way, frankly. All right, and I think this is, you know, this would leave legacy for future projects in Dubai as well to follow. No, absolutely. I think this is, you know, if we can do this building using, you know, BIM and using Revit and using these technologies and to, to do it successfully in this complex of a building, why wouldn't you do this on every building? You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, sustainability is, is becoming more of a big topic in the United Arab Emirates, and I know that the Museum of the Future will be Elite's Platinum certified building. Uh, can you maybe speak about the differences between the construction of the Museum of the Future versus other, other buildings uh, in Dubai now? Sure. So yeah, we'll be actually be the first lead platinum museum building in the entire Middle East. Um, oh. So this is quite a milestone. Um, I've only done one other platinum project. They're not easy to do. Uh, there's a lot that's involved in it. And I, I'm really impressed that they've been able to you know, get to that point with this. And there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, there's a lot with the building envelope itself. Mm -hmm. um, the, in this case, um, I think there's over 30,000 sensors embedded within the building for building management systems. Um, so that's a huge aspect of it. So we can very tightly control the interior environment, uh, um, climate in, within the building. Um, but then we're also doing things like extensive electric vehicle charging in both parking garages, um, bicycle parking. We have um, a 250 meter long tunnel collect connecting to the metro, um, so yes. people can come on the metro to the museum um, through that way. So we're, so we're really in doing a lot of that. And then one of the things I didn't even realize until recently is we have an entire offsite solar farm that's providing uh, 400 kilowatt hours of, of electricity, or 4,000, sorry, kilowatt hours of electricity to the building. Um, so a lot of our energy needs are gonna be met by that offsite solar array. Um, so while you might not see panels on the building mm -hmm. itself because of the shape, um, just about a block away we have that solar array already installed. Um, so there's a lot of really important, I think, features that are all coming together for sustainability. And we're also carrying that through to our restaurants and cafes and the museum. So we're looking at no single-use plastics, for instance. We're um, looking at um, lab cultured meats, potentially, or insect-based foods and things in the cafes to really carry that theme forward of sustainability and how we might live in the future. Nice. I'm, I'm really intrigued about your role. Um, Next year, you're opening one of the most iconic mu museums in the world. What's a typical day look like for you, if there's such a thing as typical? Sure. I mean, it's the interesting thing about directing a museum of this scale is how many different things you have to think about in a given day. So my role is really trying to keep everyone moving in, you know, in a coordinated way on everything from developing entire restaurant concepts to looking at our retail space, looking at all the exhibitions, the programming of it, and then the building itself and making sure we get the building completed, right? So there's so many different aspects, but my job is really to make sure they're all coordinated, all moving in the same direction, all on mission for the institution. Uh, and right now that also means you know, hiring staff. Um, so we're staffing up for the opening as well and making sure we have all the services that we need signed, you know, lined up for the museum to open on schedule. Perfect. Leth Carson, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching the first episode of Industry Spectrum, where we hear from innovators in the industry about projects that are shaping the landscape of the region.